Hi, everybody. How are you guys doing tonight? Doing pretty good. Good. So what we're going to talk about today is we're going to continue to talk about factoring and canceling and things like that. And um, before we get started on today's lecture, um, I wanted to give you kind of an idea of why we need to know that stuff. Um, especially in the year 2021 or just in the 2000s, it's like we have computers and calculators, like why do we need to know how to factor things? Like why is this important? Um, so just like before, I'm gonna lecture for about the first 45 minutes to an hour, depending on where I get. And then the last two hours of class is just gonna be work time. So just time for you guys to ask questions, um, get some help, work on Alex, things like that. Also just a heads up, uh, your next uh, exam isn't going to be until July 28th, so between now and then, you guys should just have some knowledge checks, which remember you have to do, but they're not graded. Okay, so sounds good? Yeah, Hugo, I don't know where you are, but I want to be there. Like, just the wood behind you makes it look like you're in a cabin, and I'm a little bit jealous. It's, it's just a, a guest room in my house I'm staying in right now because my room's not finished. Oh, okay. I'm going to pretend like you're in a cabin and I'm going to get okay. to be jealous. Okay. Nice. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. So the first thing is why do we need to know about factoring? Like who cares? So when you guys move from this class into the next math class, which could be math 146, which is statistics, could be college algebra, which is 141, one of the things you guys are going to be interested in is graphing. Now, sometimes when you graph something using a computer, if you're zoomed too far in or zoomed too far out, you're not going to get enough information. So you might see something and it might look like this and you're like, oh, cool. It's just a straight line. But if you know where all the interesting stuff is supposed to happen and you zoom out appropriately, maybe you'll get something that looks like this, which is a much more interesting story than just a straight line, and you see a lot more interesting things happening. Now, what we're going to be talking about in this chapter is we're going to be talking about something called rationals. So that's where you have one thing divided by another thing. Now, the cool thing about rationals is it usually tells you about the rate at which something is happening, right? So can you guys think of anything that might start off kind of small? and then blow way up or something that gets big proportionally. Maybe COVID cases. Do you guys remember that? <laughs> you still remembering that? Right. So with COVID cases, something we might be interested in is how quickly are these cases happening per, say, the size of a population? And that would be using rational equations. And that would look something like, Now notice that COVID cases started to go up like really, really fast and they evened out. Okay, now just for fun, can anybody tell me why it didn't just continue to increase? Like why did the COVID cases or really any disease cases even out like that? Vaccines. Vaccines, good. So not as many people are gonna get sick because they're vaccines. Anything else? Um, there could be several different cases for that because one, there could be people who had the virus but overcame it and um, had T bodies built up inside their bodies. I hope you guys know what that is, so I'm not going too technical. But um, that could happen. People could actually be staying in their homes like the government wanted us to, or I think I think cases like chickenpox your parents would actually want you to go get it. So then you could actually not get it in the future and not be affected by it, so. Right, very good, Brendan. So what Brendan said with his fancy uh, tea body language is um, once you get a disease, your body builds up immunity to it. So then you're not as likely to get it again. It's not to say that you're guaranteed to not get it again, but you won't get it again. Something that also follows this behavior which can be an example of another rational equation, is gossip. You guys know what gossip is? When you talk about somebody, right? 
So I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but there will be like a juicy piece of gossip going around work or school. And like, oh my gosh, did you hear that Jordan, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, no, I, I told, I told so-and-so, like I already know that. So what happens is that gossip spreads super fast, but then everybody already knows the gossip that you want to tell. So a lot of things have a neat relationship. Anyway, I'm super nerdy about this, so I can go on and on and on about examples, but just so you guys know, what we're learning actually has application to your everyday life, and we're not just doing math for math's sake, even though I would also appreciate that too. Okay. So. In your discussion this week, one of the things that you guys talked about that you found kind of difficult was factoring when the leading term was greater than one. So I wanted to open up today's lecture by factoring and just kind of practicing that. So if you just want to write down the first example, and then you don't have to write down the second one, just leave, um, leave that space blank and we'll get to this one. I want to leave enough room for you guys in your notes. So in the first one, what we want to do is that we want to factor this expression, which is 10w to the 7th plus 26w to the 6th plus 12w to the 5th. Now, right off the bat, it might look a little complicated because it's not a nice quadratic. That means that we have something that's to a power bigger than two, like we have w to the fifth, w to the sixth, and w to the seventh. But maybe there's something nice we can do. Maybe we can factor out a greatest common factor. So the first thing that I notice is that 10, 26, and 12 are all even numbers, which means I can factor out a two, and factor out a dose. The other thing I notice is that all of my terms have a W. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor out the biggest W I can from all these, which is a W to the fifth. Then what I'm going to be left with is 5W squared plus 13W plus <clears throat> All right, how are you guys doing so far? Is this looking okay? All right, good. Now that I have it looking a little bit nicer, and now that this part is a quadratic, I have to figure out how to factor a quadratic that has a leading coefficient that isn't just one. So the way that I like to do it is I like to do that AC method. So I'm going to take that first and the last coefficient, I'm going to multiply them together. Now what I'm going to do is that I'm going to run through and I'm going to try to figure out what factors of 30 can add up to 13. Does anybody know any good factors just right off the bat? 3 and 10. Is that what you said, Hannah? I saw you mouth it. Okay. Dope. Yeah. <laughs> so that could be 3 and 10, which is great because that adds up to 13. So what that means is what I can do now is that when I'm rewriting this guy, I'm just going to keep the 2w to the fifth out in front, is that I can rewrite 13w as 3w plus 10w. Now here's a question you guys asked last time. Does the order matter? Does it matter where I put the 3 and does it matter where I put the 10? And the answer is you want to try to put the 3 and the 10 with numbers that you think they have a common factor with. So 10 and 5 have a common factor of 5, so I probably want to group those guys together.
All right, now what I wanna do is that I wanna pull out the greatest common factor for each of these pieces. So I broke it up into two pieces and I wanna pull out the greatest common factor. So here I have 5w squared plus 10w. So the greatest common factor there would be 5w. Here, the greatest factor would be three. So I'll pull a three out of this guy. And now what I can see is that both of these guys are being multiplied by a W plus two. W plus two. So what I can do is I can take that W plus two and I can go ahead and factor that out and then I should be done. And that would be the final factoring. All right, before we move on to the next example, I just want to pause here for a second and see if you guys have any questions on that. Hugo. So you factored out the W plus two, that, wouldn't that mean both of them go away? So we just be the uh, two W to the fifth times five W plus three? No, so since we're factoring it out, it doesn't disappear. So that would be true if we were dividing both sides, but since we don't have another side, it doesn't go anywhere. You see what I mean? Yeah. By the way, uh, Hannah French, you remember when we met the other day and you were trying to find that one problem and you couldn't find yeah. it? I found yeah. it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's in the lecture notes. So I just wanted you to know. Oh, cool. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Sorry to call you out in the middle of the lecture, but I was just too excited. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Great. Do you guys feel like it would be worth your time to try to factor one of these on your own and see how you do? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, so the one that I'm going to have you guys factor on your own is I'm just going to give you like a couple of minutes, try to factor this one on your own. And when you're done, if you could put up a thumbs up emoji or just wave at me, that would be totally cool. So get messy, make mistakes.
right, I'll give you guys about one more minute to wrap that up. And don't sweat it if you're not done. All right. So, how many of you made it this far? Looking good? Yay! All right. Awesome. So, now what we want to do is. Yeah. Uh, oil as well. Good. Awesome. So, we want to take the two and the five and we want to multiply those together. So, we get 10. And then we need to figure out what factors of 10 add up to 7 which is pretty nice because it's two and two five. And. Yeah. So if we were to break this guy up, we would have three V squared. So we can break up that seven V into a two and a five. Because I have a two here and a five here, I probably want to group that two with that two and that five with that five. So I took that 7v and I split up into a 2 and a 5. Now I can factor each of those pieces individually and hopefully a nice common factor falls out that I can pull out of there. So these both share a 2v, which when I factor that out, on this piece I'm just going to be left with a v, on this piece I'm just going to be left with a 1. Here I'm going to pull out a 5. So I'll just be left with a V on this part and a one on this part. Now, because this is being multiplied by a V plus one and this is being multiplied by a V plus one, I can take that piece and I can factor it out. So that'd be two V plus five times V plus one. Hey, I have a question. Yeah, Christopher. So when you when you're finished with and you have three V squared uh, and then parentheses, two V plus five parentheses, um, V plus one, does it matter which set which pair in parentheses is before or after when you're writing it as a finished answer? Nope. The order okay. doesn't matter. So if you switch these two around, perfectly fine. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Um, I am I'm very confused. Okay. So were so, you okay with this part? Yes. It's the last part. Right here? Um, yeah. Getting from here to here? Mm hmm Okay. Perfect. That's usually where people get confused. So thank you for <laughs> asking and please don't feel bad at all. Okay. So if I have a times B plus A times C, because these are both being multiplied by A, what can I do with that A, Rudy? Um, that's gonna become A squared. It's gonna become A times B plus C. Wait. <laughs> A times A is going to become B plus C. How? So this is A times B plus A times C. So you can mm -hmm. rewrite that as A times B plus C. And the reason is, is because if you expand this guy out, you would have to multiply A times B and multiply A times C. 
when you expand. Oh, okay, got it, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So because these two things are equal, that means that you can go from this to this or from this to this. You can go backwards and forwards. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense so far? Yes. Okay. So if we have 2v times v plus 1 plus 5 times v plus 1. Mm -hmm. This is being multiplied by v plus 1. And this is being multiplied by v plus 1. So just kind of like a is being multiplied by both of these terms. I can take it and I can move the v plus 1 in front. I can say, oh, okay. Since they both have a v plus 1 in common, I'm going to move it out in front. And if I take away the v plus 1 here, I'm just left with 2v, right? Yes. Plus. Okay. Yep, and then if I take the v plus 1 away from here, I'm just left with the 5. <laughs> Is that a little bit better? Okay. Good? Yeah, it makes sense now. Okay, good. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm so glad that you asked because I think <laughs> a lot of people, they're like totally okay from all the steps until you get here. And then when you pull it out, they're like, where did it go? What happened? Yeah. Okay, great. You guys okay if I move this paper? All right. So we're going to do a little bit more factoring now. These factorings that we're about to do are going to be just um, a little bit more fun, I think. We're just going to do the first one. I don't want to spend too much time because I have other things that I'd like to get to today. But remember, if you have any questions, you can always ask during the last part of the class. So this one, which I wrote poorly, this is 25u squared plus 40u plus 16. <clears throat> now, some of you get super jazzed about math. I'm assuming. I haven't seen it yet, but maybe by the end of the term, you'll get super jazzed. And right off the bat, you might be like, okay, I'm going to take what she just taught me, and I'm going to multiply 25 times 16. And my immediate response to that is bleh, gross. It's a huge number. It's really hard to work with. Please don't do that. Okay. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this and I'm going to use my love for math to see if I can see anything interesting. So the first thing that I'm going to see is 25 and 16. Can anybody tell me why 25 and 16 are such beautiful numbers? Because they have the same uh, multiply by four. They're perfect yeah. squares. They're perfect squares. Yay, they're perfect squares. So right off the bat, because 25 is five squared and 16 is four squared, I'm like, oh my gosh, this might just be a perfect square. So because these are perfect squares, I'm just going to guess that this is a perfect square, and then I'm going to check my answer and see if it's right. Now, I know in math, guessing and checking kind of feels like cheating because math is supposed to be super straightforward, but math is a science. And what you do is you start with a hypothesis, and you test it out, and you learn from it. So let's be scientists. Is anybody here familiar with Miss Frizzle? Yeah? Okay, that's that's my soul twin right there. All right. So I'm gonna guess that this perfect square is five u plus four squared. Do you guys see how I came to that guess right there? Five u and the four? 
All right, so I want to see if that's my actual answer. So I'm going to expand this just to check my work and see if I actually do need to do all that gross multiplying or mess around with the quadratic equation. <sighs> so when I expand this out, we're going to do first outer inner and last. Which if we clean it up a little bit, 20u and 20u, that's going to give me 40u's. So when you're trying to work through these problems, try to keep your eye out for really nice numbers. And by nice numbers, I mean perfect squares. So 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, etc. I have a question. OK. Hey, yeah, why, why did you add the, the 20 U to plus 20 U to, to, to there you got 2 U there? Right here? 20u and 20u makes 40u. So if you take 5u times 4, yeah. you get 20u. And if you do yeah. 4 times 5u, you get 20u. Yeah, but uh, when you add it, do you have 2u there? You don't add 2u as 2u square? No. So when you're adding this, what this yeah. is kind of saying is it's saying like, oh, here I have 20 apples and 20 apples so that would give you 40 apples right it's not until you start multiplying that you get squares okay good thanks for asking all right any other questions before we move on looking good all right i don't really think we're going to get a whole lot of questions until we um really start doing some more work in here all right so what this is going to lead us into is rational functions. You guys are going to learn a whole bunch about this when you get into 141. So this is just kind of a gentle slide in introduction. Okay. So rational functions, just so you guys um, kind of have an idea of why they're important. They're used a lot if you're looking at population growth or if you're looking at the rate at which something grows. So like the percentage a disease grows, the rate a disease grows. Um, I use this a lot in predator and prey models, which is pretty cool. So like foxes and rabbits. So foxes eat rabbits and then their populations go up and down. It's actually like one of my favorite things in the whole world, but I digress. So what you might see when you're looking at a rational function is you might see k of a equals a squared divided by 2a squared plus 3a minus 5. Okay, and this is a good review for evaluating functions. So let's say that we want to evaluate this function at negative 2. Okay, so if we want to evaluate this function at negative 2, what that means is that we just replace the a with a negative 2 on the left-hand side, so we need to do the same thing on the right-hand side. So everywhere I see an A, I'm going to replace it with a negative 2. So instead of A squared, I'd have negative 2 squared. On the bottom, I'd have 2 times negative 2 squared, 3 times negative 2, minus 5. Now, in your discussion post that you guys had this week, a lot of you said that you really liked function notation, and especially once you got it down, you said it was a lot of fun. So that was really good to hear. So now that I've entered in that negative 2, I'm just going to simplify this a little bit. 
So negative 2 squared is going to give me 4. 2 times negative 2 squared, that'll give me 8. Now, I'm a very uh, guilty person when it comes to not watching my negatives, so I'm going to move real slow right here. 3 times negative 2 is going to give me negative 6. And negative 5. There we go. All right. So that'll be 4 divided by 8 minus 6 minus 5. I believe that's going to give me negative 3. How's my math looking? Looking okay? All right, nobody said anything, so we're going to get started. All right. So that would be my answer right here. Wait, sorry, what did the negative three, eight minus six minus five? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, sorry. Eight. No, it's okay, yeah. sometimes you have to say it out loud. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. All right, so the one thing that I wanna point out that I saw a little bit when I was looking at the worksheet from last week is that once you get an answer here, you are done. You don't have to keep messing with this side this side has already done its job, which is telling you, hey man, replace that A with a negative two on the right-hand side. Then your goal. Okie doke. Okay. All right. The last thing that we're gonna talk about when we're talking about rational functions is finding the domain. Now the domain is actually a super big deal. And here's why. There are certain things you can't do in math. One of those certain things is that you're never, ever, 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 ever allowed to divide by what? Zero. Okay, good. Some of you are like, um, cat. You're never allowed to divide by zero. Okay? So, if this was an equation for, say, a population or something, we wouldn't ever want the bottom to be zero because what that means is that you'd have a population explosion. And what happens after population gets too big? It nosedives and goes extinct. Do not want that, okay? So when we're finding the domain of a rational function, the key thing is we don't want the bottom to be zero. So since we don't want the bottom to be zero, what we're going to do when we're looking at a rational equation, aka a fraction, is that we're going to look at the bottom, we're going to set it equal to zero, figure out what values make it equal to zero, and then we're going to kick those out of the house. Now, when we're solving this <clears throat> for zeros, one of the easiest ways to solve quadratic equations for zeros is to factor it. So that's what we are going to use that last little lesson on, is that we're going to use that to factor this so that we can find those zeros so we don't accidentally plug those numbers in and create a black hole in space. So like before, I'm going to take 2 and negative 5. That's going to give me negative 10. So I want to see what factors of negative 10 would give me a positive 3. I would say 5 and negative 2 would. So I'm going to have that as 2a squared minus 2a plus 5a minus 5 equals 0. So remember, that tells me I can rewrite 3a as negative 2a plus 5a. Now I'm going to factor this out. So that'll be 2a times 
times a minus 1 plus 5 times a minus 1 equals 0. And then since this is being multiplied by a minus 1, and this is being multiplied by a minus 1, I can take that a minus 1 and I can factor it out. going to pause here for a second because factoring is always such a pain in the butt and I want to see if anybody has any questions. Nope, he goes good. Anybody else? <clears throat> okay. All right. So what we want to figure out is what A's would I plug into this that would make it equal to zero? So really what I'm asking is, hey, what A value would make this piece zero and what A value would make this piece zero? The reason is, is because what's anything times zero? Zero. So A minus one is gonna equal zero when A equals one, not too bad. All right, on the second piece to figure out what a value would make that one zero, I have to do a little bit more legwork. So I'm going to minus five from both sides. And divide both sides by two. And I get a equals negative five half. All right, we're almost done. We just have to write down our answer. <clears throat> so it's really easy to get done with a problem and you're like, I'm done. But the key thing is that we wanted to find the domain, which is that we actually didn't want the bottom to equal zero. So for our domain, We would say A can be any number except one and negative five half. By the way, it's not a hashtag, it means number. So when you're entering this into your homework or if you're talking to another student, teacher, mathematician, scientist, right, um, there's a much shorter and elegant way to write this answer, especially one that Alex will like. And the way you would enter your answer is that you would say, hey, my domain is any number starting from negative infinity, but then you have to stop at five halves. And then you can pick back up on the other side and you can keep going until you hit one. Then you can go from one to infinity. Now I don't mean to influence you guys with my personal preference, but I kind of hate this way of writing it. This is the way that I like to write it. I think it's a little bit more clear to the person what you're trying to say, which is saying this. Hey, my algebra, A can be any number as long as A doesn't equal one or negative five halves. That's my favorite way of writing it. Uh, 
All right. Any questions on that guy? Looking good. Okay. Are you guys okay if I move this piece of paper? So the last thing I want to talk about is um, I'm going to talk about just simplifying um, when you're multiplying two things. Then what we're going to get into on Wednesday is we're going to get into actually adding and subtracting these rational functions. So adding and subtracting fractions when they have variables in them. Also on Wednesday, what's going to happen is that after we learn how to add, multiply, divide, and subtract these, we're going to get into some word problems, okay? So it would be a super good idea to bring some questions in on Wednesday, especially the word problems ones, so that we can get some one-on-one. -on -one. Sounds good? All right. So last thing we're going to talk about before I take a break <clears throat> and go get some tea, because mama's allergies are insane today, is we're going to be talking about simplifying. Now, I want you guys to just put down your writing utensil, okay? Look at my face like you're in trouble with your mom, okay? Okay, what cancels multiplication? Now you guys say it. What's the opposite of multiplication? Division. Division. You guys were like, is she tricking us? What's going on? Okay, great. What's the opposite of division? Now you guys say it. Multiplication. Okay. Will you please notice, and you're still, like, you're not in trouble. I'm just saying this really uh, feverishly. Can you cancel out division with addition? No. 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 Can you cancel out division with addition? No only multiplication. multiplication okay good i don't mean to haunt your dreams but if i do <laughs> then that works okay so why i went through that and made you guys look at me so intensely is one i love your faces and two um i'm gonna show you a couple of mistakes that people make when they're canceling and these are super common so right here we have 100 times x to the third, y to the fifth, divided by 36 times x times y to the eighth. And what we want to do is that we want to simplify it. So we want to cut it down a little bit. Now, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to factor out that 100 and that 36 to the best that I can. So let's see. Hmm. I know that 100 is the same as 25 times 4. And I also know that 36 is the same as 9 times 4, x times y to the 8. All right, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look between the top and the bottom. I'm going to look if there's anything in common that are multiplying. So I can't cancel 25 and 9, but I can cancel the 4s out. So those are going to go away. Now x to the third, that's the same as x times x times x, right? So I can cancel one of those x's with one of these x's on the bottom, which will just leave two x's being multiplied on the top. Yep, good job. Now this, y to the fifth, that would be y times y times y times y times y. And on the bottom, I'm not going to say it, but you know. So these would cancel with this and leave three of those y's being multiplied times each other on the bottom. So when I simplify this out, I should get 25 
that 4 went away, that x became an x squared, and everything else canceled. Divided by 9, 4 got canceled, the x got canceled, and y got reduced to y to the third. All right. How did you guys feel about that? Did that feel okay? I have a question for you. If there is an addition on the numerator, then that can, it can be simplified, right? No. If it was just... I'm so happy that you asked. Uh, Rudy, you make my life so good. So <laughs> for example, something that I see a lot of is that people will have something like C plus eight divided by eight. Okay. Now, can you cancel those eights out? No. The reason you can't cancel these out is because the operator between these two is addition. And do you remember when I just said very seriously <laughs> that addition doesn't cancel across division? Right. The same thing is true if you have 8 over c minus 8, for example. Because these two are subtracting, you can't do that cancellation over the division sign. So you can't simplify them. Okay. But, and I'll just skip this one and we'll just go straight to this one since we're kind of already on that train of thought. Do you see how we have p plus 1 on the top, and then we have p plus 1 to the second on the bottom? Because that's an entire term in itself, and it has parentheses around it, that means that it's multiplying the other term. So you can cancel those guys out. But remember, you're not canceling just one of the additions. You're canceling the entire term out. So remember, you're not canceling the addition, you're canceling the entire thing in that multiplication parenthesis. Does that make sense? Feels clunky the way I'm saying it. Okay, thank you guys. And then this 2p minus 1, that's being multiplied, again, multiplied times itself four times. And this 2p minus 1 is being multiplied twice. So this whole thing is going to cancel out, and this multiplication is only going to happen two times. So that would be 2p minus 1 divided by p plus 1. Again, if you see parentheses, even if there's addition and subtraction, you are OK to cancel across that. All right. Cool. So I used up my hour of talking at you time just to give you guys a heads up on what we're going to learn next time. Next time we're going to be doing some more simplifying where we have to factor first and then cancel. We're also going to be looking at some of these rules. So some tricks of the trade on if something doesn't look like it'll simplify, but it actually does. Okay, these are going to be really helpful to us on Wednesday. We're going to move into adding and multiplying, dividing and subtracting rational expressions. So doing all this good stuff. I'll teach you guys some neat uh, rules of thumb. And then after we do a million examples, we are going to get into ba -ba -ba -bum, word problems. All right. I know, I know. Oh, I know, guys. But if it makes you feel any better, every time I see a word problem, I hear my yoga instructor in my head. And she's like, even if it's not comfortable, even if it feels bad, if you're not going to be here forever, don't forget to breathe. And I'm like, namaste, girl. Like, she's the best. So I'm going to go take a 15-minute break. When I come back, um, if you guys are still here, you're welcome to ask me questions, work together, make mistakes, figure stuff out. Sounds good? Okay, I'll be back in 15 minutes. 